Hello and welcome back to new 332 uh, Buddhisms and Psychotherapies. Um, uh, and this is the second half of lecture, or the second lecture, depending on how you want to look at it, for uh, March 8th, although I will actually, I imagine, be releasing it on March 11th. Uh, so thank you for your patience and the, uh, the extension uh, policy being sort of applied to me. Um, I realized, in fact, somewhat belatedly that I was, of course, not the only uh, person doing this. I, not, I, and I don't mean the class, I rather that I was thinking about the Olympics. Uh, and I realized that, <clears throat> and I realized that the 2020 Olympics are being held in 2021. Um, which is sort of a strange idea. They're still the 2020 Olympics. They're just being held in 2021. So by that same token, this is the March 8th lecture. Uh, so today's lecture, you know, as you've already seen in the Buddhism's half of thing, is on right effort. Um, right effort, right diligence, this question of exertion. Now, from a, a therapy side, this I think is a really interesting question, right? Um, the making of effort, right? Making efforts is one of these sort of key areas um, in the change process that frankly is often kind of a black box for people, right? So the way that we tend to approach effort um, is a little bit like the way that we approach attention, right? We approach attention by telling people pay attention, right? But of course we never tell them what exactly that means. Um, it, it's something of a, of a fruitless exercise in that sense. Um, for many years, I've been involved in a research project with a, a private school uh, coming up on gosh, eight, eight years. Um, so I've been involved in this, this project where we've been testing out neurofeedback uh, technology for um, teens. Uh, and so neurofeedback technology is, is this... Um, you know, it's a technology that in some ways has been around for a, a long time, but recent advances in sort of sensor design and computerization have made this um, much more accessible, much more off the shelf. Um, yeah, cheaper, basically, uh, and more portable and less yucky. So this is a system where you use an EEG based system. Um, so you're measuring people's brain frequencies, brain waves, right, at certain locations. And you take that data, and of course, there are certain frequencies of brain waves that are associated with certain states of mind, broadly speaking. Okay. So, uh, for instance, if somebody's brain waves are, you know, moving relatively quickly, and say the, the beta range, as we call it, right, that typically signals uh, a relatively high degree of, of attention. If they're moving too quickly, it may signify sort of an overactivation, right? Might signify that they are right, really keyed up. If the waves are a little slower, the alpha range, typically it means they're kind of tuned out, slightly dissociated, daydreamy, whatever. If it drops below that, it means they're really, really kind of tranced out. If it drops below that, they're typically you know, unconscious. Um, and neurofeedback, I mean, has a long and fascinating history, but basically what you do is you take those brain waves in this modern formulation, you feed them into a computer, and then you have certain performance metrics, right, which uh, are outputted from the computer um, based on whether or not people are keeping their brain waves in approximately the range that you wish, right? So why is this interesting? Well, because you can feed it into a video game and then you can make performance in a video game dependent on people hitting a certain range of, of brainwave, right? Um, and in our particular case, what we were interested in is people managing to keep themselves in the low beta range, which is associated with calm focused attention. So what we had was a lot of right high school students putting headsets on, right? And playing a video game. And you can imagine something like, um, you can imagine something like a racing game, okay, where you've got two objects, where you've got two objects. <laughs> uh, let's do, let's see, is my phone? Uh, okay, a racing game where you've got two objects, okay, and they're racing against each other. And as long as your brain waves are in the appropriate focused area, right, they're sort of where you want them to be, then your vehicle moves along. Right, at a certain speed and the computer vehicle moves along at a fixed speed. So winning the race or losing the race is dependent on staying in this state. There's an immediate feedback. And you can create all kinds of additional mechanisms right, around that. 
Okay, so this is this is neurofeedback. It has a long and fascinating history. Um, and uh, when we started implementing this system, one of the things that I thought was quite interesting about it, right, is that it gave direct real-time signifiers to people about when they were paying attention. Okay, now what does this have to do with, um, with sort of right effort, the question of effort? Typically speaking, when we say to people, pay attention, we're not providing them with any kind of procedural instruction. We don't tell them how to pay attention. How do I pay attention? If you've ever tried to pay attention, and I imagine most of you have, because presumably you're engaging in some kind of meditative exercises, say, where paying attention suddenly becomes the sort of thing where you're like, God, how do I do this, right? We, um, we don't tend to provide much in the way of procedure. We just kind of thump our fist, right? Pay attention. Well, it's very similar in my experience with effort we have a set of misconceptions around effort. And when we tell people like, you need to make an effort, it's like, what does that mean? How do I make an effort? You know, what, in what way am I supposed to make an effort? How do I get that feeling? And many people, a vast number of people, particularly people if they're sort of depressed or anxious, et cetera, but really people in any state of stress will suddenly find, of course, that their ability to make an effort just suddenly doesn't seem to be there. Now, there is a folk conception around this, that this is sort of dependent on, on willpower. And we have seen the oh, recently badly gutted research around, um, uh, around sort of the marshmallow test and uh, self-regulation, right? And this was supposed to have a model for how this whole willpower effort thing work, right? Ego depletion. Um, the problem is that stuff is not replicated well. In fact, it's replicated spectacularly poorly. Um, so after years and years and years of sort of referencing the marshmallow test, uh, sorry, for those of you that don't know, the marshmallow test is this classic test, okay, of what's called ego depletion or what was supposed to be called ego depletion. So the idea is you put a marshmallow in front of a kid, basically, um, and you um, basically tell them like they can eat it now or they can wait. And if they can wait, then they'll get two marshmallows. It's that simple. You can do it with cookies, you can do it with whatever, right? So if you can either eat it now or you can wait, and then you put it in front of them and then you either sit there or you, you leave the room often, that makes a difference. Uh, and what you see is this sharp difference in the degree of self-regulation because it is in some sense objectively better, right? If you, at some level, if you wait and get two marshmallows or three marshmallows or four marshmallows or right, however long you can wait. The longer you wait, the higher the reward. Right, uh, but of course the immediacy of the reward is directly in front of you, and this is sort of a very live problem, especially for kids, because kids don't have self-regulation typically on the same level as as adults. Sometimes, um, in in the cases where adults have developed self-regulation, the research around this was, you know, the marshmallow test was supposed to be this test of self-regulation and this test of ego depletion but like a lot of the time, meaning that a variety of these kinds of exercises where delaying your gratification, right, uh, could be modified by certain kinds of things. So taking a sip of a sugary drink, for instance, was supposed to, um, you know, sort of refresh your stock for ego depletion. Now, at some level, okay, these concepts around self-regulation and ego depletion must be referring to something, but it turns out to be sort of much more modifiable than we think. Even within the original research, right? There's this, um, you know, general thing that's like if you believe that your amount of sort of willpower, right, at some level is fixed, right, then you will perform less well on these tasks than if you believe that it is, you know, unlimited. If it's, you know, if you believe that willpower is functionally infinite, right, you will actually perform better. You will go longer. So this already seems to indicate that sort of beliefs, right, and, and what's going on um, in your own head, what you think about your efforts makes some kind of difference relative to your ability to output effort. But you can see that the, the marshmallow test is trying to get at something in particular. It's trying to get at this willpower. And the willpower, again, is, as I referenced last lecture, a particular kind of willpower. It's this, enkratia. Can you resist? There is a temptation in front of you. Can you resist it? All right. Now, it's interesting. You know, in those studies, kids talked about 
a variety of the strategies that they use successfully, right? And notably, they were generally not provided with strategies, right? But they talked about the, the kids that did manage to delay. Okay, they talked about strategies that they used successfully. And leaving aside for a second, okay, that there seem to be a variety of other factors here. So for instance, the dominant one that has really put a hole in this research is that socioeconomic factors make, an, make a huge difference in people's performance on this, which is to say, if you're a kid from a fairly rich family, you're not that worried about getting a marshmallow crammed in your mouth because treats are not in short supply. You have not existed in a world where, right, like getting a cookie is some kind of exceptional event Right? And so your desire to have it, right? Or for those of you that grew up in households that had a lot of people, um, you know, at sort of one point in my childhood, my, my father's house had, I guess, me and my sister and my stepsister and my stepbrother, right? And so things like cookies could sometimes go missing with surprising speed and an, an elaborate set of rules sprung up around it, right? But for people that grew up in big households, like I've known people that grew up with, you know, six or seven siblings, right? Those kinds of households, it's like, you got to get your piece when you get it, right? So you can imagine how those factors, how, how social factors and economic factors are going to alter this, right? It's going to seem much more salient to you. However, Leaving all that aside for a second, it is nevertheless interesting to pay attention to, right, regardless of how we end up interpreting all this data now that it's sort of in, in contest. It's interesting to look at some of the strategies that the kids describe when they describe, right, successfully resisting the marshmallow. Because a lot of these strategies involve reframing the marshmallow in various ways, right? So, they pretend that they're not looking at a marshmallow. They pretend that they're looking at a like a fluffy cloud, right? Or another one, they literally put a frame around the marshmallow, right? So they imagine a frame around the marshmallow. Uh, and in so doing, imagine that it's a picture of a marshmallow. You can see in both of these cases, there's something specific happening. They're abstracting. Now, on the other hand, right, you look at the ways that you can drive people towards eating the marshmallow, right? And you can do things like, right, get them to consider how delicious the marshmallow would be. You drive them towards that sensory level. Um, and, it, and if you do so, you're sort of like chewing away at their ability to resist, right? Uh, in, in Freudian terms, you are lending strength to their id, right? You're sort of lending strength to their appetites. Oh, remember how good marshmallows are, et cetera, et cetera. Now I add this text, test would have been exceptionally easy for me as a child because I don't like marshmallows. <laughs> Um, I like them if they're like in the fire, right? Like, I actually like them burned, to be honest. So I like to directly light it on fire and then pull off a burned skin. That's my take on marshmallows. But like just a marshmallow sitting, oh, it's like squishy, eh, does nothing for me. So I would have performed, obviously, fairly, fairly well on the test. I could have let those marshmallows pile up all day and then just sweep them off the side of the desk. Ugh, marshmallows. So, um, you know, when we consider, right, that that body of research, one of the things that's interesting that comes out of it is that it indicates that there is a certain kind of procedure in, right, that what they're not doing is engaging in this kind of just raw resistance to it. Instead, what they do is they reframe it, right? They, they try to alter the way that they see the marshmallow in such a way, right, as to, um, as to have it have less of a of an effect on them. So, so there's sort of a variety of these things around effort when you consider it, right? There are both misconceptions and there are sort of useless modes of training, right? We bang on the blackboard in a classroom and say, pay attention, but we never kill, tell kids how to pay attention or what exactly one does to pay attention. What's the procedure to pay attention, right? You know, should I like open my eyes up like the guy in Clockwork Orange, Alex in Clockwork Orange, you know, uh, is that paying attention? Is it paying attention if, you know, like what, what does it feel like to pay attention? Well, think about, interestingly, I mean, this is something that kind of came out of neurofeedback. Think about what it's like. So most of you have probably seen a cat, right? On the, on the like the stalking right mode. Maybe it's stalking your feet, maybe it's stalking a mouse or a bug or a bird, right? You've probably seen this. If you haven't, you can easily find a video of it. And like, look at what the cat is doing. The cat is low to the ground, okay? And the cat is sort of motionless, except you'll get some 
tail flicking, right? And the cat is extremely intent, but you don't get the impression that the cat is making an effort to be intent. It's extremely intent because it's extremely interested in what it's looking at. And it is sort of highly, highly, highly focused in this direction. So much so in fact, that if a cat is in this state, right? Or it's like this, it's pretty easy to sneak up on a cat under those conditions, right? There was a video actually on the CBC just the other day of a guy out in BC who had a, a lynx. Um, so like a big cat, pretty big, a lynx that snuck in and started killing his chickens. And, uh, and he grabbed it by the scruff of the neck like a kitten and hauled it out. Now, I've seen lynx. Uh, <laughs> that is not an animal that I would grab in that way because I feel like it, you know, there's a good chance that it would rip your guts out. But like he grabbed it by the scruff of the neck. And the question you have to ask there, of course, is like, how did he do that? Like, lynx have good senses. How, why did it see it coming? And the answer is, of course, that it was very intent right? Well, it's probably so intent that it had hedged out the other things that he could sort of grab it. Well, it's the same with a regular cat, right? A regular cat goes into this low motionless focused state. That's paying attention. Now, right, finding that feeling within yourself is a matter of getting some kind of reasonable feedback. So allow me to use another metaphor here for a second. Riding a bicycle. Riding a bicycle is one of these tasks where we <laughs> don't instruct people very well. Um, now, I say this as a kid who learned how to ride his bike really late. Okay, so I was a quite, I was quite late compared to my siblings and my peers, right? Um, it was probably like nine by the time I learned how to ride a bike. And one of the reasons was, and this is something, of course, that I've encountered since, but one of the reasons was that I didn't have a very clear procedural sense of what exactly it was that I was supposed to be doing. So, right, when people are teaching a kid how to ride a bike, they often provide feedback and advice that sounds like it is meant to be sort of instruction, but it isn't, right? So an example of this is like, keep going or don't fall over. Don't fall over is the most useless advice. So thank you. You know that. Oh, was I not supposed to do that? Like, but keep going is a thing that parents will routinely say, and this really is an expression, honestly, of their own frustration and futility. Uh, it is not primarily actually an instruction. It's just them attempting to try to say something. But this doesn't really answer the question of how to ride a bicycle. When I was trying to learn how to ride a bicycle, it frankly became a chore. It was something that was an effort, like literally on Saturday, I would have to do my other chores. And then, you know, if it was warm enough, I would get out on my bicycle with my father. And this was something like I had to do. It wasn't, wasn't something that I was choosing to do. It was like, now we have to go ride the bicycle. And I approached riding the bicycle in a relatively top-down kind of cognitive way. That was how I was used to solving problems. I was used to solving problems with, right, <laughs> with intellect. And it's not the kind of problem that you solve with intellect. Like, think about what it is that you're doing. And, you know, you get on the bicycle and you start pedaling. You have to get up to a certain speed. At that speed, gyroscopic forces begin to kick in, and that helps. But also, you just learn the trick of balancing on the bike. Well, how did you do that? You don't do it consciously, right? You don't, it's not like you're making conscious corrections, because if you try to do that, you're going to tank out, right? Which is its own kind of feedback, right? Getting the skin taken off your face a few times does provide you with a certain incentive for not falling over. But generally speaking, what happens is that you're getting feedback from your inner ear, right? Your inner ear is this consistent, you know, sort of sense of balance. It can tell you when you're off balance. And so gradually you get a kind of integrated motor set and an integrated balance. And all of a sudden the robot here takes over. You don't ride a bike consciously. You don't do it through conscious procedure, right? And most of the conscious procedures that we use, right, to try to tell people what to do don't typically have an effect, right? So um, interestingly, just as an aside, the way that I did finally learn how to ride a bike, um, I was riding a bike behind my uh, mom's and it was getting to the point where, you know, for a long time, my stepbrother had been quite accommodating. Uh, in terms of like riding me around town on the stunt pegs and stuff. And I had basically adjusted myself to this. I just like, well, I can't ride a bike, like whatever. I'll just, you know, I'll solve this problem in other ways. But finally I was, you know, trying to learn how to ride a bike with my mom and my mom was a considerably more understanding 
bicycle instructor uh, than my father. And so there was a kind of an empty lot behind our house where there had been an industrial, uh, there was like a factory. And so this was their parking lot before they closed. And so, you know, I'm riding around in this, this empty parking lot behind our house. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not getting it, right? I'm not riding. I'm able to ride for a few pumps and then I'm kind of going over. And this is an intensely frustrating experience for me. I'm applying a lot of effort because also by this point I have developed a significant amount of shame, right? Around the experience. And then there were sort of three kids who lived, um, you know, on sort of a half street behind me who came out uh, to two boys and a, and a little girl who couldn't have been much older than maybe four. Uh, and they started making fun of me and I got mad, <laughs> really mad. And I got mad enough that I came after them on the bike. No, I wasn't about to do anything. I was not a violent child, but like I got, I got ticked off because they were mocking me and I, and I went after them on the bike. I remember very clearly uh, that there was a moment where I went past a little girl and she said, my brother has a hammer. It's one of those flashbulb memories. My brother has a hammer. Um, I get the impression they were kind of latchkey kids. I don't know what they were doing. Four-year-old was wandering around by themselves or with other kids. But anyway, uh, this is the early 80s. So this kind of thing happened. So I went tearing after these kids and basically chased them down the block. And it wasn't until I chased them most of the way down the block that all of a sudden I realized that I had ridden my bike. Now, there's something quite instructive here, I think. Um, and it's not, it's not the educational value of rage uh, although sometimes that's true too. Uh, every once in a while when I'm teaching essay writing, I try to tap into people's um, anger, right? Because a lot of the time with essay writing, right? The key here is, well, you know, you have to express some kind of position, right? And argue for it. But a lot of the time people feel weakly about things. Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, right? If you can tap into something that they feel strongly about, and if you can't hit it in other dimensions, if you can't hit enthusiasm or whatever, you can hit anger. What's, what pisses you off, right? And why does it piss you off? This is a very strong motivation, <laughs> being pissed off about something. And if you can tap into that, then all of a sudden you can be like, I want you to come up with reasons and arguments and people will, right? They naturally will, but of course, under those conditions, right? You can tap, you can tap into that sense of anger, that sense of outrage to do work. You can make it do work, right? So in this particular case, I'm, it's not primarily that I'm talking about the motivating power of um, anger at being teased, although that was it, like that broke things open there after I could ride a bicycle. But rather that it's interesting to me, it has been interesting to me most of my life, that, that the thing that was required there was that I get out of the way. And what I mean is that I cognitively get out of the way. My mind had to be occupied with something else so that the robot could do the task. And once it was the case that I was sufficiently motivated in a particular direction, the robot just did do the task. It became effortless. Now, thereafter, I rode a bike, God, obsessively. I, I became, um, I sort of had a love affair with the bicycle. Um, I, I spent basically the entirety of my 12th summer just riding around on my on my bicycle. By then I think I had gotten, yeah, I got a mountain bike. By then, so just riding around doing mountain biking and doing street biking on my bicycle, listening to my, my Walkman. Uh, so that's actually kind of dangerous, but I would listen to music and just like ride around. I grew up in a relatively small town, city, 20, 21,000. It was not big, so it was relatively safe. Although I certainly did lots of dangerous things, lots of threading the needle, shooting traffic and that kind of stuff, things that are not wise, um, but they were fun. So, you know, the point is that I had to get out of the way. And when I got out of the way, right, all of a sudden, the mechanisms kicked in, and it was no longer effortful in that way. Now, if you think about your experience of riding a bike, and if you can't ride a bike, right, if you've never ridden a bike, you can't ride a bike, you know, I appreciate it. It's possible you've never had this experience. I assume that most of you have. If you haven't, uh, it is worth undertaking to do so. It's a, it's a very valuable experience, I think, in a lot of ways. Bicycles, um, more so than motor vehicles, I think, and, and I'm an avid motorcyclist, but more so than motor vehicles, uh, they approximate sort of the sensation of flying. They're sort of fascinating in that way, right? You get this real force multiplier in your speed. There is this sense a lot of the time when bicycling is going well of it being like a free flowing kind of state Right? You lean your body to move and you're very in contact with the vehicle. 
Okay, so that idea, stepping out of my own way so that something can become this, this effortless thing, right? Passing that task off to the rest of my system made a very deep impact on me. Now, part of the reason I bring this up, and we are coming around the right effort, is that this is an area where, properly speaking, I think my thinking is not sort of Buddhist in the orthodox sense. Rather, most of my thinking in this area is probably more properly traceable to Taoism, which is to say that I am and, and have been for most of my life uh, a proponent at various levels of the idea of Wu Wei, right? Effortless action. Wu Wei. This is the idea that, right, the Taoist idea that you shouldn't be straining all the time. You should be aligning yourself with the flow of things and then it just kind of slipstreams, right? Wu Wei, effortless action. Now, uh, in some ways, actually, that is, right, a reasonable Buddhist territory because, of course, Taoism, right, ends up uh, meeting with Buddhism and you get Chan, which becomes Zen. Uh, in Japan. So Zen has a, a, has a real thread of sort of Taoist thinking in it. Um, and if you're not familiar with Taoism, I would encourage you to become familiar with Taoism. Um, uh, Lao Tzu is a uh, sort of a brilliant thinker and, um, you know, the Tao Te Ching is, um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the great sort of, you know, it's one of the great Chinese works, but also it is one of the sort of great works of thought. Um, generally speaking, or considered to be so, and there's a reason. So this idea of Taoist Wu Wei, effortless action, has a very deep impact on me. Now, there are, of course, potential deleterious effects to having this kind of attitude. So in my early 20s, maybe longer, uh, I had a kind of motto that was only half ironic. Uh, and the motto was, there has got to be an easier way to do nothing and still feel good all the time. <laughs> there has got to be an easier way to do nothing and still feel good all the time. Now, when I coined this, I immediately recognized how bizarre and toxic kind of an idea that was. It was like, oh, that's like the worst impulses, okay, of our, our sort of technological hedonist culture. And it's true. There are some aspects of our technological hedonist culture that that I definitely, definitely sort of absorbed as values. I like shortcuts. I like force multipliers. I like it when I can do things in some sense the easy way. As I have mentioned, right, I, uh, I have always sort of had an intense distaste for making an effort. And one of the things that I'm going to try to point out here is that a lot of that came about because I was making all of these efforts in areas where really I shouldn't be making efforts. It wasn't about making an effort itself. Making an effort itself can be quite pleasant, right, under the right conditions. Um, but making the efforts under sort of conditions all over the place begins to make the whole world feel like this, a constant state of resistance and a constant state of strain, right? It draws down our resources. Okay, but this idea of effortless action Wu Wei, right? There has got to be an easier way to do nothing and still feel good all the time. Now that's a kind of toxic formulation in a lot of ways. And you can see that all over the Western culture, right? The ease with which we do things and how we have used technology to ease that path causes us a large number of problems. We've made things too easy for ourselves. You can see this, right? You can see this in lots of different areas, frankly, right? Um, access to information is, in my opinion, actually in some ways much too easy. And I, I'll admit, I don't totally know how to solve that problem. I'm not an information theorist, primarily speaking. But having easy access to information, right, has all kinds of effects on us, right? If you've had the internet go down, or you know, you've had that experience where you start to feel like you're going to rage out because a web page is taking five seconds to load. It's like you've really adjusted to right a, a reality of convenience. And the same thing goes for lots of other things. People react extremely intensely when they don't have an immediacy. The same thing, and I brought this up before, applies to, frankly, a great number of technological innovations. So like fast food and our food culture generally, <clears throat> represents a kind of tremendous technological innovation over previous food gathering. When we were hunter-gatherers, 
yeah, we used to spend, you know, a few hours a day searching for food, but there weren't that many of us. If you want to feed a large number of people, agriculture. I mean, that's why, right, the world population explodes after we develop agriculture. But what we've eventually managed to do as a society, right, with technology is we've produced the ability to just have massive numbers of calories. And now, of course, in the developed world, right, um, which is to say the rich world, right, what's one of the primary health concerns? Well, being overweight. Well, the reason we're overweight is that as a species, right, as a, as a subspecies of ape, human beings retain fat more efficiently than any of the other great apes. We retain fat very efficiently. Why do we retain fat efficiently? Another thing that we do very well uh, is we walk long distances, right? We're, 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 a, we're a walking ape. We're good at walking long distances, abnormally so compared to other apes, right? So this is our upright gait. And you put these two things together and what you get is a species that's used to walking really long distances, right? And then sort of gorging when it reaches a location with food, right? We pack fat on a fashion, we pack fat on efficiently. I'm clapping my own reserves. Uh, we pack fat on efficiently because that gives us a storehouse. We're designed to feast and famine or we're designed to feast and fast, right? Of course, we've lost the fast side of the equation and most of us aren't walking miles and miles and miles to get anywhere, especially these days. Uh, it used to be the case that I walked like an hour a day. Now my route to work takes me through the kitchen. So hopefully, hopefully ending once I get the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which I keep making the joke, you can, it's no tears, you can squirt it right in your eyes. Um, you know, but basically, you know, once, uh, you know, once things are sort of returned back to some semblance of normalcy, presumably the degree of exercise will go up and so on and so forth. But that doesn't change the fact that, right, I can go get an absurd number of calories for a very small amount of money, right, at any time. And my system genetically just isn't designed for that. It's too easy, right? It's too easy. It's too easy for me to get calories. Another factor, right, in that same thing, right, one of the factors that has occasionally been tagged on sort of weight, right, and, and people gaining weight is our homes are too warm. Like, what does that mean? Well, you know, we keep our homes very heated, right? I mean, you know, I wear short sleeves at home. Now, I tend to run kind of hot anyway, but I wear short sleeves at home. And the reason is we all have these extremely warm domiciles. Well, you, you know, roll the clock back, um, you know, roll the clock back a few thousand years, you know, 10 or 20,000 years, and ask yourself, you know, how warm you think your ancestors were. Were they consistently very warm? No, sometimes they were cold. And when you're colder, you burn more calories, right? This is why, this is why high-end gyms will turn the, the AC up so high, right? And, you know, there's sort of hot yoga, but there's also cold yoga out there, but you know, gyms will turn the AC up, they'll make it colder. And it's because your caloric output to keep your body temperature the same is the same, right? So our homes are really warm. We're not spending the same kinds of calories. We're not moving as much. We have vehicles to get that. And now of course we have something sort of one up on the vehicle, which is I don't even have to leave my home and you don't even have to leave your home for us to have this kind of exchange. It's all very easy, right? So there is a side of this where ease, sloth, et cetera, are problematic for us. But let's consider the other side. So when we're talking about, you know, right effort, right? And again, I wanna emphasize right effort, not hard effort. Well, what is it that we sort of see in and around science and psychology um, in this consideration? One interesting thing that I like to look at when I'm sort of considering this, this question is um, uh, chess, chess players. And this is going to seem somewhat unrelated, but like, let me sort of run this and, and you can see it. So when people are just first learning how to play chess, right, they make illegal moves, right? They don't, they, they don't have the rules internalized enough to, right, to know which moves they're, right? So they'll go to do something and the person they're playing with, who presumably is teaching them with a computer or whatever, will say, no, 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 no you can't make that move, right? Um, you can't make that move. That's an illegal move. So they're still seeing illegal moves. Then after a while, okay, they stop seeing illegal moves unless they're really tired, right? Um, but they stop seeing illegal moves. The moves that they see are only legal, but they still make quite bad moves, right? So for somebody who's a serious chess player, 
right, who plays really seriously, will look at something that an amateur chess player does and be like, that is, that's a bad move, right? They would never consider that move to begin with, okay? A serious chess player then stops sort of seeing, in some sense, the, the bad moves, and they see good moves. And interestingly, grandmasters, okay, so we've done a series of experiments where we have tested the memory of grandmasters. And it turns out that grandmasters have a remarkable memory, okay, for um, the layout of the chessboard. You can show it to them for a few seconds and they can reproduce it, provided that the chessboard is set up in a way that makes sense, right? that the chessboard represents what would be an actual plausible chess game and isn't just a random scattering of pieces on a board. If it's a random scattering of pieces on a board, they perform no better than anybody else in their ability to grab this. Why? Because they're chunking it, right? This is an idea from psychology that we chunk information. So it's a lot easier for you to remember, right, um, a, sort of a, a, a string. The classic version of this is if I show you, you know, 12 random letters, for a few seconds, you, you'll you look at them and then I'll ask you to reproduce them and you'll get the first few and you'll get the last few and you'll forget those in the middle. But if I do the same thing and the letters in question are FBI, CIA, NSA, um, NFL, right? You will chunk those because each of them is a meaningful sequence to you. You'll chunk them and because you chunk them, you can pull, pull them and right? You can retain them very easily after a few seconds and return them, chunking. This incidentally is I may have already brought this trick up with you guys, but um, this is one of the pieces of advice that I give people when they're creating their passwords. Don't rely on password managers. I mean, you can if you want, but um, the only thing, right, coming up with a password, computer password or an account password, the only thing that matters is length. That's it, period. This is, this is an actual case where size matters. Uh, the only thing that matters is length. That's it. That is the only factor. I mean, picking an extremely common one, password one, two, three, four, yeah, you're basically asking to get your account hacked. But other than that, it's just a question of length. And what you should do, and I picked this up from, from my good friend, Leo Ferrari, what you should do is rely on the thing that you do that the computer does very poorly. One thing that you do is you meaningfully chunk things and the computer does that poorly. What it does is high-speed combinatorial processing. So if you have an eight letter password, it can just crunch through the combinations until it gets there, right? That's what it's good at. Um, what you're good at is this meaningful chunking. So uh, one trick that you can use here is take a, a few lines, you know, from a song that is your favorite, right? Or one of your favorites, a song that you love, right? And convert each letter, uh, or convert each word of the, the lyric. So it should be a lyric that you can reproduce by heart. Right, something that matters to you. This also works with a prayer and it works with you know a bunch of things, but take each letter and convert it into a lowercase letter. If there are any proper names, convert them in uppercase letters. If there are numbers of any kind mentioned in the, in the line, convert those into numerals. And if there's like an emotional expression at the end, like an exclamation point or a question mark, add that in. And what you will end up with is a great big string that you can very easily reproduce on the keyboard from memory quite easily, but it's also a long enough string that the computer can't get it chunking, okay? So the point is that when chess masters perform this chunking, right, when grandmasters perform this chunking, they look, and because it's a meaningful board state, they can just absorb it. If it's a meaningless board state, if it's just a chaotic jumble of pieces on the board, they don't perform better than average. But if it's a meaningful state, they can see it, which means if we put this all together, non-chess players see, right, illegal moves, Chess players who know how to play, albeit amateurs, no longer see illegal moves. Masters, good players, basically no longer see bad moves. They do not consider them anymore, right? Grandmasters mostly stop seeing moves at all. What they see is board states. They just see chunked board states. They're manipulating this at a much higher level. Now, this is very consistent with what we see, interestingly, in sort of other um, other areas. So for instance, toddlers have considerably more brain connections than uh, slightly older children. A toddler, a two or three year old has a huge number of brain connections compared to a slightly older child or an adult. Why? Because you would think having more brain connections, right, would make you better at stuff. And toddlers are frankly not particularly good at things. Um, 
And the reason is, of course, that they have a bunch of useless connections. What happens is that there is a massive pruning, right? The connections that are the effective connections get kept, get, uh, get uh, retained, right? They get kept. And the connections that are ineffective connections get pruned, right? They wither away. So what you eventually get is optimized sequences of action, right? Likewise, if you scan the brain of an expert scan, if you put them in an MRI or an fMRI, an fMRI generally, I guess you could probably do it with a MEG. But if you put them in, 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 uh, in some kind of active neuroimaging technology, what you will see is that uh, people who are sort of experts at something show considerably less brain activation than non-experts. Now, if you think about this, this actually does sort of make intuitive sense. Not all science does make intuitive sense, but consider it for a second. If you don't know what you're doing, you are trying all kinds of things. Think about when you have undertaken a highly repetitive task, right? And at first you're like doing it in this really like weird, inefficient way extra. And gradually what you do is you start to compress those steps, right? You start to come up with sort of an efficient flow path. You do the same thing every time, right? But it's extremely optimized and you get good at, at doing it and clearly mimicking some kind of computer task, right? Um, and you can improve that, right? This is sort of Harry Harlow's learning to learn stuff. You can improve that obviously by paying attention to your process, right? You can reflect back on your process to optimize it in some way. But what all that means is that to have expertise, right? And efficiency is not the only thing, but to have a certain kind of expertise is essentially to expend less effort in a task, right? A martial artist or a dancer will learn efficient paths of motion, right? Fluid paths of motion so that motion is conserved so that you're not jerking your limbs around, right? Um, there are sort of optimal strategies that people who develop an expertise in something use. You know, for those of you, if you undertake the solving of a mathematical proof, right, that I suggested, you know, and the ones that I suggested are pretty simple, but if you've ever done, you know, symbolic logic or, or done a proof or anything of this kind, right, if you were taking that kind of thing, um, you will have had the early experience possibly of sort of like uh, flailing a little bit as you're trying to solve it. Like, is it this kind of thing? Or if you've done stats, right, same kind of thing, right? There's this period of uncertainty around it where you're like, I don't quite know what I should be applying, like, but so um, there are false starts. We've all had this experience, I'm sure, in an exam. It's like, well, how do I solve it, right? And then once we are more familiar, we're just like, oh, right, I recognize this, or at the very least I can narrow the space, right? Uh, shout out to relevance realization for those that are familiar with CogSci. So I can narrow the space. I have a set of heuristics to narrow the space, which means you're expending less effort. You're considerably more efficient about, it. oh yeah, you know, how you do it is this. Same thing, imagine you were like trying to do work on your engine. Like, what do you do? You take it to, you know, if you can't make your own repairs, you might just generally investigate, but failing that you take it to an expert and the expert can hear a sound or they look at a thing, they take a couple measurements, right? And they're like, oh, here's your problem, right? And they have a very efficient way ah, 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 there. Okay, there you go, solved. And sometimes that's amazing, right? But the point is that they're expending considerably less effort. Now, there are numerous sort of parables in Zen around this thing, because Zen having absorbed a measure of Taoism has this idea. So one of the famous ones is about a butcher, I'm really shifting back and forth between Buddhism and psychotherapy this week, but anyway, we'll get to it. So uh, one of them is about a butcher and this butcher, you know, is, is widely considered to be the best sort of meat cutter uh, in the area. And, uh, and he's never sharpened his knife. All the other butchers have to quite regularly sharpen the knives and he's never sharpened his knife. And at some point, somebody asks him, like, how do you do it? Like, I don't understand how you do such clean, clean, quick cuts and never sharpen your knife. And what he says is, well, I make certain that I never use the knife to like hack at the bone or hack at the flesh. Instead, I move it in the spaces between. I move it through the joints and I move it through the, the gaps, right? So, you know, there are like joint, you know, joints and it's like I move it through the joint, I move it through the empty spaces. And in this way, right, my blade never dulls because I'm always moving it through these empty spaces. This is a kind of very Taoist image, right? To move through the empty spaces, to take the path, path of sort of least resistance, effortless action. And we're used to thinking of that actually very often in sort of like amoral terms, make an effort. But the question rather is 
where should you make an effort? Now, I'm going to propose that if we think about this, you will find that sort of the, the whole process of effort undertaking, right, is obviously pretty closely tied in with questions of motivation, right, with questions of motivation. If you are less motivated, you require more effort, right? That's pretty straightforward. If you, if you have less motivation, if you have less internal intrinsic motivation, okay, then it requires more effort to do something. And there is always a certain amount of resistance that's coming from the other side. So, you know, here is your motivation, and here is the resistance, right? And where the resistance overtakes, right, is slightly higher than the motivation in some sense, that is where effort is required. That's essentially what I'm going to propose here. That is where sort of force of effort, having to overcome your natural tendencies is suddenly required. Now, as I mentioned, I think that as a species, we are somewhat hardwired, frankly, towards minimum effort. This is a good genetic strategy, right? Getting as much as you can for as little as possible is an excellent genetic strategy. Um, you know, as evolved organisms, we, uh, you know, exist in scarcity conditions. And so ice cream is a good idea because it's, you know, absolutely full of calories and salt and fat and like, all of the things that would be scarce like there's no ice cream in nature right and so of course it's it's a super stimulus right it hits what the food industry calls the bliss point right so from an evolutionary perspective like of course it's delicious and the same goes for fast food which is engineered obviously also to taste really good but like <clears throat> it's it's designed to give us a whole lot for not much never mind the other health effects which is something else to talk about same thing, exercise. <clears throat> the amazing thing about exercise to me, and people are like, exercise is good for you. It's like, yeah, yes, it is. But, you know, it's good for you when that's somewhat incidental. Under a natural evolved condition, we would get lots of exercise because we would have to, right? We would have to be like climbing up trees to get fruit, and we would be walking around, and possibly we'd be getting into fights. Like, we would be using our bodies because we would need to to survive. But failing that condition, uh, our, the best evolutionary strategy is to expend no effort, right? <laughs> Sitting on your couch from the position of evolution is actually quite a good strategy. It's minimal expenditure of energy. The real miracle is that, frankly, we can engage in needless physical activity that is painful to us and come to enjoy it, right? Again, it's a bit of the reframing. Remember I was talking about throwing a frame or thinking of the marshmallow as a, as a cloud? Well, feeling the good burn after a workout. Oh yeah, good burn. It's like you're experiencing pain. Like the fact that you've managed to reframe it and that you distinguish between good burn and ouch, I, I injured myself, right? But like the fact that you managed to reframe, oh yeah, good burn, I love that good burn. This is a, a reframing that you have to sort of do. It helps that your body dumps endorphins on you, but even that right, is a, is a strategy that it's using basically because it thinks you're hurting yourself, which you are. <laughs> so the real miracle is that you manage to reframe, right? The path of least effort is what your body wants to do. So you have motivation, right, on one side, you have resistance on the other. And motivation and the science around motivation is one of these areas that actually has ended up being quite striking in a lot of ways, right? So for relatively early behaviorists, it was given that the motivational theory worked like this, there were intrinsic drives, like food and sex, okay? And so those were sort of like biological drives, okay? Food, sex. And then there was external motivators, right? External motivators, reinforcement, punishment, and reward, okay? And it was the interlocking of those systems that determined why things did what they did. Except starting in the late 40s, that notion started to really fall apart. Okay, now I think if they had thought about it deeply, it would have fallen apart anyway. But right, so in, in 1949, Harry Harlow, who actually I already mentioned, but Harry Harlow, a psych researcher who did so much interesting research, that guy was involved in so many interesting different areas of psych research, but he did this experiment. It was supposed to be pretty simple. They took monkeys, they stuck them in boxes, and they put a certain kind of lock on the box, right, that that required some solving. And the idea was that they were going to sort of test this, test various forms of sort of motivation and um, and uh, behavioral learning, right? It was a very behaviorist kind of thing. And somewhat to his surprise, 
uh, Harlow observed that the monkeys started messing around with the locks, you know, on their own time for no reward. They were just like, what's the deal with this? What's the deal with this lock, right? They would start playing with it such that by the time he finally got to the experiment, right? The monkeys were performing in really good time, really, really good time. Um, and, uh, you know, he was sort of a bit puzzled by this, right? He was a bit puzzled by this because it didn't fit with the model of motivation. The model of motivation said that since there was no sort of reward associated and that they weren't meeting a biological drive exactly, right? That they shouldn't have any incentive to waste their time or energy fiddling around with something, playing with it, right? And yet they did. And what he kind of came to is like, hmm, it seems like what we want to do is describe this as some kind of intrinsic motivation. And he had some ideas about, I wonder how this would be affected if we rewarded them with raisins and stuff. But basically, he dropped the research. It was too complicated, right? 20 years later, another researcher, Desi, started getting into this research um, but with this kind of thing, but with humans. So we would do puzzles with humans. And one of the interesting things about that research, okay, 20 years later, is that he discovered that, um, you know, if you uh, had people doing, you know, puzzles, putting things together, like take these pieces and assemble them so that it looks like this, right? You know, he could split them into two groups, the one that he was giving a reward to, here's money, and the ones that he wasn't. And it turned out that the ones that he gave money to, right, would do it more, like quite a bit more, right? That's sort of what we would expect. But if he said to them, hey, you know, uh, you know, we're going to do this three times. And the first two times he gave money. And then the third time he was like, hey, just to let you know, right, uh, we're, so we're not actually paying for this third one at all. Part of this experiment involved him sort of he would leave them alone with the puzzle. So it's a little like the monkeys. He'd leave them alone with the puzzle. Say he had to go do something on a computer and he would go to the observation room where he could see them from the mirror and, and observe them, which is a little spooky. But anyway, where he would observe them from the mirror. And so the, the idea was that they were measuring how much people spontaneously chose to engage with the task. And it turns out that you know if you leave people alone and they've done a puzzle for a bit, right, they will start trying to figure it out. Right? They'll just do it to see. But the group that you reward, the group that you give money to, if you tell them there's no money in this, their interest drops off sharply. Their interest drops off sharply. If you pay them for a task, it goes up sharply initially. But then their intrinsic desire to do it, their desire to just play with it on their own time drops off sharply. We see something very similar when we test um, children in, in this sort of respect, right? So if you... Um, take kids and you give them the opportunity to draw, right? They'll draw. If you reward them for that drawing, here's a dollar for your drawing, right? Uh, their output will increase considerably, although their drawings get crappier typically, uh, but their output will increase considerably, right? They'll draw and give you the drawings. But then if you suddenly withdraw that, withdraw, yeah. If you suddenly stop offering that reward, their desire to spontaneously engage goes down. Offering an ex extrinsic reward seems to inhibit access to intrinsic reward. And the intrinsic motivation is just like our desire for play, to just do it for its own sake. Okay, now this has big implications, I add. And this is something I talk about fairly often, but it has big implications, frankly, for um, the way that we structure compensation and things. For people who do creative jobs, the idea that we all have is like, well, the way to motivate them is to offer big cash bonuses. But actually, that is quite likely to erode right, their spontaneous ability to do it. As much as possible, in fact, you want to sort of divorce right, the reward structure from the work. Um, this, I add, is actually something that I think is relevant to therapy. Uh, and, and I say this on the therapist side, which is this. I do not have a very close mental connection between the work that I do and the money that I'm paid. Like, I'm, I, I'm aware of it, obviously, at, at a certain kind of level, right? Because I have to do invoicing every month, right? And so I have to send invoices out to clients. And, you know, there are certainly times when I am thinking to myself, like, Oh, okay. Well, that's you know, da, 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 that's good, I guess. I'm making money, but but honestly, I do not have a running tally in my mind of how much money I am making in a month. 
I don't think about it. It's actually a relatively low concern for me. Now it's enough that I don't worry about it. It provides me, you know, comfortably, right? Um, I mean, I teach at the university and I do that and I do a bunch of other things, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's enough money that I don't worry about it really. Uh, and so I typically don't think about it. In fact, I'm often quite bad about getting my invoices out <laughs> uh, because it's just not on my mind. What's on my mind is the actual sessions, the actual contact that I'm interested in. And I'm interested in it for the same reason that I've always been interested in. I find it intrinsically interesting. So yes, it's paid work, but I don't really associate closely individual sessions with compensation. And I think that that's actually good, right? Because if I was going into every session going, like, give me my money, right? Then ultimately speaking, I'm just not going to want to engage those mental processes in the absence of that kind of compensation. And that's a danger, right? Anytime you're sort of doing work that you love at some level, if you're, right, if you attach compensation to it closely, you're likely to squash internal motivation. That was one of the things that happened with my writing. And one of the reasons I decided to stop being a paid writer was I liked writing too much. I didn't want to have this thing where I felt like I was chaining my writing onto, right, somehow getting paid. I want to make a quick distinction here real, real quick too, okay, which is talking about this model where it's like motivation on one side, right, resistance on the other. Motivation on one side includes all the extrinsic motivation. It includes rewards and punishments. Those are important, but it includes a large measure of that internal motivation too. And usually, in my experience, that's actually a place where you want to try to bolster people when they're trying to undertake efforts of various kinds. That, incidentally, is among the primary reasons why I structure uh, essay writing in my courses the way that I do. I have people make proposals. And the reason is that it is much more likely that somebody is going to hit on something that they are intrinsically interested in. Now, that produces better work. Right? And I think it's more valuable to them because they're doing something that they actually care about. But on top of that, it's just easier to write. Easier to write about something you care about. As I mentioned with the anger thing, that's a form of motivation. Anger is a form of motivation. It taps an emotional state and a value. And so, you know, if you're sort of angry about something, but not too angry, not so furious, you can't think clearly, right? Um, you're tapping into an intrinsic value-based motivation in some way. This is a much better way to get things done you care about things. And that's one of the reasons why I do it. It requires a little more top-down kind of thinking and a little bit more effort to get there than just getting the topic. But then once you get it, you can rely on having a higher motivation and engaging it. It's something you care about. That can be a problem too, because it can lead to perfectionism and so on and so forth, of course, but uh, which we'll touch on a little bit in the technique today. But nevertheless, this is the idea and there's resistance. So I want to say one more thing, uh, actually, actually a couple more things, and then I'm going to get to sort of this system, and then I'm going to get to the interventions. I'm definitely going over an hour today, so I do apologize, but it's okay because I'm a few days late. Okay, so first thing on this question of work and effort very quickly. Um, when we're talking about effort, people often conflate that with work. You know, work is effort for extrinsic goals, right? If it's effort towards intrinsic goals, it may require effort, but it's not necessarily work, right? Work is something that is about that extrinsic goal. It's about getting that reward. This is why I have strong objections when I hear the very common phrase, a good marriage takes hard work. This expression bothers me. And there was a period of my life, I was such a contrarian, there was a period of my life where I took uh, as a sort of quick mental heuristic, I took the idea, the minority isn't always right, but the majority is always wrong. Now, as it turns out, that was not, because no heuristic is universal, right? Uh, no such thing as a free lunch. So there's uh, always conditions where that isn't gonna apply. But the idea was, you know, I heard this expression over and over again, a good marriage takes hard work, a good marriage takes hard work. And so I decided, well, let's assume for a second that a good marriage does not take hard work because everybody says that, but people's marriages are not particularly good. So what are they missing here, right? And that's the general idea. It's like, well, whatever the common idea is or whatever people are actually doing obviously isn't working that well or things would be different. So, you know, let's start by, let's start by dialectically opposing that idea and see where we get. 
So the idea I started with was, you know, a good marriage takes hard work. And I was like, well, let's say that it doesn't take hard work, but it does clearly require effort. That's obvious. So what does it require? And the answer is hard play. If you think about starting a relationship, you think about starting to date somebody, you think about a friendship, you're starting a relationship, what do you do? You play, you play hard, right? It's not, you know, you undertake effort. Certainly there's effort involved, but the effort is pleasurable play-based effort for its own sake. You play games, you go to movies, you have conversations, you have sex, probably not with your friends, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but the point is like, you, you know, you're undertaking all these play efforts for their own sake. You're enjoying the person's company and you're enjoying the activity. And then later, it's like, we have to undertake a lot of hard things with the goal of a relationship. And it's like, no, your relationship was formed originally, right? By being in this state of play, you're putting your effort into play, but all of a sudden you want to shift things to this extrinsic goal, right? You want to shift things into this extrinsic kind of model, hard work, right? You know, it's like a Protestant hangover. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't require effort, right? There is an effort involved in, right? There's an effort involved. And at some level, I suppose you can construe that as work, right? You could be like, well, I need to work on my listening skills in my relationships because I, I realized I'm not listening and it's hard and it requires effort. But that's not quite the same as work in a conventional sense. I mean, I guess you're doing it for the extrinsic goal of your relationship being improved. But it's sort of not work in the conventional sense. And improving your relationship, generally speaking, is actually grounded in in hard play. Okay, thing one. Thing two, effort can be a mirage. And what I mean by this is that people very often expend unnecessary effort because they get an emotional payoff. So, so this is sort of, um, this is like outlined in the effort justification theory of uh, Leon uh, Festinger. So effort justification basically says it's a kind of sunk cost cognitive dissonance-based theory. Basically, if you have put a whole lot of effort into something, you will rate its value as being higher, right? It's a way of resolving cognitive dissonance. It's like, well, part of your mind is going, we put in a lot of hard work. And the other part of your mind goes, well, if we put in a lot of hard work, then I guess this must be valuable, what we got for the hard work, right? So it's got some sunk cost, it's got some cognitive dissonance. But Festinger's idea of effort justification actually explains like a whole ton of things that people do on the regular. People make things much harder than they need to be. This is very easy to observe often in other people and hard to observe in oneself. But like, I can give a quick personal example, okay? Um, for many, many years before I returned to the university, I used to have this idea that's like, the only degree, as such a snob, the only degree that I'm interested in is an honorary degree. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that I, you know, was sort of disenchanted with the school system and I didn't want to involve myself in conventional education, but I still wanted like the reward at some level, right? I still wanted to get the thing. I just wanted to do it in a completely outside the box way where my own efforts and my own time and whatever would gradually and eventually be recognized. It's so wonderful that somebody would decide to hand me an honorary degree, right? It would be to the system because it's like, no, 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 like, see? Now, the thing about that is that's all well and good, right? I mean, it's actually completely filled with sort of ra raging ego issues, which thankfully have largely resolved, but it, largely. Um, but you can also sort of see, and it, it's like, but wait a minute, like, what's your actual goal here? And I had certain kinds of goals that I kept attempting to get to in this really uphill way. Like it just made everything harder than it needed to be. I could have just done a relatively conventional and streamlined thing. And there are in fact streamlined things. School, as it turns out, is a very streamlined way to enter certain kinds of things. It's, there's a short path. Likewise, when I trained as a therapist, I mean, there's a lot of like atypical ways I could have gotten to that goal. But what I ended up deciding to do after contemplating all kinds of other paths, as I mentioned was, took the shortest path because I was less interested, ultimately speaking, in like providing myself with a ton of additional challenge and so on and so forth. The challenge that I was going to get was going to occur once I was in the job. Like I sort of knew that. And so what I needed was a short route, which provided accreditation, which allowed me to enter the actual field, the actual line of work, not to do a bunch of additional education. And the thing is, of course, with providing additional challenges, it often overlooks the fact that 
the world provides plenty of its own challenges, plenty of its own challenges. You can remove the additional challenges that you're adding on to things and people add that kind of challenge to things often because it makes them feel good, right? We feel good when we're struggling sometimes against tremendous odds, but at the same time, that can produce this sense of like impossibility. So we make things hard and then we feel good and then we feel particularly good about the stuff that we get, but we're, we often don't consider that it's like, whatever level of achievement we get, if we, if we sort of slipstream ourselves up, right, to some thing, there's still challenge. The challenge just goes on. There are always more challenges, right? If, if you want to engage those things, there's no reason to make stuff unnecessarily difficult, right? Unnecessarily difficult under many conditions. Now, what's the flip side of this? Since this is where this gets tricky, like with exercise, maybe you do actually want to make things unnecessarily hard. That's what exercise is, right? There's a goal state. I, you know, I do not so much have a six pack or an eight pack. I have sort of have a, like a micro kegger. And if I didn't want to have that, right, <laughs> then I need to undertake unnecessary effort, but it's not unnecessary because it is attached to a goal state. So, right, you try to figure out like, what are the actual, what's the actual level of effort required for me to meet my goals at some level and to not add extra effort. If things are easy, just let them be easy. That's okay. And people will get freaked out by this. Oh, it seems too easy. It's like, well, yeah. And sometimes that's true, right? If it's too good to be true, it often is. But in many cases, we just make things unnecessarily hard. Now it's easy to say that, like so many sort of therapeutic bygones, it's easy to say it and it's sometimes hard to implement. But like, think about it. Think about the ways that you yourself probably make things harder than they need to be, right? And you do, I almost guarantee it, right? There are definitely places where you make things more difficult than they need to be. And sometimes you only see that in the rear view mirror. You look back on it and you're like, wow, like I really made this in a much bigger problem or I somehow complicated it way past or, you know, I, right? A great deal of cognitive distortion has to do with this. It has to do with this idea of like, you know, wow, I really like added a bunch of suffering where there wasn't any. And you can see this connection back to Buddhism and Taoism. Okay. So, okay. Um, I have talked and talked and talked. I want to talk about three more things and then I'm going to wrap up for this week and I'll carry stuff forward. So the first is when we're talking about motivation versus resistance, on one side, you wanna increase motivation. You can do that by tapping people's values. You can do it by getting them to consider reward structures more deeply, right? You can clarify those various things. This is where things like motivational interviewing, if you have a structure like the one that I've talked about in mind, try to get them to tap a play state, try to get it to connect up with their intrinsic motivations, try to get it to connect with the biological motivations, try to get it to connect up with some sense of reward and punishment, right? Well, you gotta be a little careful with that. Good, that's the motivation side. Here's the resistance side. And the resistance side can consist in additional things that we add in, but also it can consist in anxieties and fears, and it can consist in a sense of scale. One of the things that I encounter most commonly in people's resistance is a sense of like impossibility or intractability, right? The problem seems too big, it seems too big. When that's the case, I almost always tell my client or the person that I'm talking to uh, the story of uh, Michel Lotita. Michel Lotita is the man who, between 1978 and 1980, ate a plane. He ate an airplane. He ate a Cessna 150. A Cessna 150 is not a huge plane, but it is an airplane. This is a guy who, over the course of his life, is estimated to have eaten approximately nine tons of metal. Tons. Nine tons of metal. Now, he ate an airplane. Seems like he really did this. He had pika, which is its own issue, right? He ate things that aren't food um, somewhat compulsively, but you know, he managed to, I guess, turn this into a pastime. That's not what we're getting at. What we're getting at is that he managed to eat a plane. How did he do it? How did he do it? He ate it in small pieces. Every day, he ate it in small pieces. If I were to take you out into a field and show you a pile of all of the food that you have to eat for the rest of your life, it would be a disgusting mountain, right? You would be like, and I'd be like, okay, eat that, right? Huge pile of all the food you're gonna eat for the rest of your life, right? Eat it. 
and, and it would be completely overwhelming. And that's the thing. How do you eat it? Well, you eat it gradually over the course of many, many years. You break it into small pieces. Same thing. He ate a Cessna 150, and that's how he did it, right? Broke it, ate a bit every day, ate a bit every day. Incidentally, it didn't appear to harm him too much. In fact, it maybe thickened his stomach lining and gastric juices, which is sort of fascinating in its own right, not that I'm recommending eating a plane. But the point is, this is a story that I use a lot of the time to signify. It's like, no, 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 stop thinking about it as a mountain. Think about it in small, discrete tasks, as small as possible. If you can think about things as a two-minute task or a one-minute task, you're onto something. You know, if you want to undertake, you know, exercise or meditation, you start very small. And then once you, you know, if it's small enough, you're like, whatever, I'll just sit for one minute and it's fine. Right? It's much more likely to sit for two than it's much more likely to sit for five, then 10, then 20, and so on. Right? Same thing with exercise. Get in the habit of going to the exercise, you know, just go, put the stuff on and go. Even if you just like, whatever, run for a minute and then stop. Because once you've done that, then you're already in the mindset, okay? So you wanna get the opening thing as small as possible. You wanna take as small of a bite of the plane as you can. Because if you see it as a plane, it's just gonna be like, oh, I can't, right? That's this side of things. And then there is the question of the effort in the middle. So what are some things that we use to to affect this. And there are two techniques that I want to talk about. The first is a phenomenological approach called strength bombardment, right? It's uh, sort of been called that since 1988, strength bombardment. It's a good name. Um, so strength bombardment is a strengths-based approach. Um, there are a number of strengths-based approaches in therapy, right? Where rather than focusing on people's, you know, perceived downsides, you're trying to build up their sense of strength. And strength bombardment is something that you would do either with an individual client or you would do uh, in a group setting, depending. And the way that this works is you're trying to get people to refocus on tasks where they have sort of, uh, you know, successfully negotiated or achieved something to locate the strengths in those, often you're working this in dialogue with them. You're locating the strength within it, and then you are feeding it to them and getting them to reflect on it repeatedly. I talked a little bit about this technique before when I was like, rather than using um, affirmation, I'm good and I'm smart and I'm great and everyone loves me, instead just picturing things where you crushed it, right? Where you killed it. Picturing those moments where you really crushed it. Strength bombardment is a bit like that, but it is sort of more structurally formalized, right? Because the idea is that you're looking to pull out these strengths. What are your strengths? Where have you succeeded? And you, right, feed it back to people repeatedly and you get them to feed back to themselves, possibly with a visualization or an affirmation. Now, when you do this technique, strength bombardment, you do it in a group, it takes on a slightly different tone. In all cases, you have to have, of course, rapport for any of this to have traction. But uh, it has a slightly different tone because what you get is right a group um, where you would go around and be like everybody please tell this you know tell the person you know something that you see as a strength and they all chime in and everybody says something about you that isn't meant to be nice it's meant to be an accurate perception of your strength groups get good at this as they go they gradually figure out what the game is and it's not sort of flattery and horseshit it's about authentic encounter and really bringing stuff up right this is one of the benefits of, of group work. So uh, also because it models all the interpersonal stuff that people are often having trouble with in the world, right? So, you know, everybody's like, you know, offer strengths. And the idea, right, is that you're being sort of bombed with that strength. And because you've already built up group trust, because the rapport is already there, and you sort of take what these people say, right, you, you, it is easier for you to incorporate this. This is about creating your sense of strength, which sort of reduces the resistance. You're reducing the amount of effort that you need to apply because you're creating a sense of your own strength. If you have a sense of strength, right, then applying effort is suddenly much easier. It's easier to approach a problem from a position of strength, right? It's easier to approach a problem. Okay, so strength bombardment, that's one technique. The other technique that I wanted to talk about very quickly because Frankly, actually, because it more directly interfaces with what we were talking around of the Buddhist concept of right diligence and right and um, right effort, a mental discipline component, is a technique called thought stopping. So thought stopping is an interesting one. It's fairly sort of it's cognitive behavioral in its orientation, but the idea is that you are um, identifying with a client an area where they, you know, are having um, a particular kind of thing, say an intrusive thought. Okay, and first you have to do the regular training. They have to sort of identify the, the, the thought that they find problematic 
And then they have to sort of learn how to identify it as it's happening. And that can be difficult. A lot of the time, it's the case that there is a frustrating middle period in therapy where you learn to identify something after the fact, and then eventually you learn to identify it sort of in the moment. And then eventually you can sort of learn when it's incoming, right? And you can intervene there. That's the goal. But in the middle, there's a frustrating portion where you can identify it, but you can't do anything about it, <laughs> which often drives people very, um, makes them feel really intensely crazy, frankly. Right? And it's like, just to remind them, it's like, no, no, this is part of the process. It's the middle period. But anyway, they have to learn how to identify it. So let's say that they have an intrusive thought of some kind, right? They learn how to identify when it's happening. And then the idea is that they're just reinforcing stop and literally saying it often. Okay. So one of the ways that you would do this as a clinician, for instance, uh, is, you know, you have the, the client have their hand, for instance, on the, on the chair, and they're thinking about stuff. And when they learn, right, when they start having it, they just raise their finger. And you, you, right, the therapist, are like, stop. The idea is that they want to internalize this stop. Now, it's easier to do this than you might think because there's kind of a training link that occurs. So this is gonna seem like a funny link, but um, I have uh, a friend who himself has a friend named Mike Bailey, okay? And I don't know why I started doing this, but every time my friend brought up the name Mike Bailey, I would respond <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why I started doing this. It was just a weird vocal tick on my part. Um, but every time he was like, blah, 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 Mike Bailey, I would say, Mike Bailey. Uh, I stood for why I started doing this is anybody's guess, but I started doing it. Um, and every time he said Mike Bailey, I would say Mike Bailey, often pretty quietly, right? So I did this, you know, for a while, you know, and then it got to the point where this is how this stuff works he would be talking and he would go on and he would say da 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 mike bailey and then he would say mike bailey we internalize each other in this way right there's a little bit of there's a little bit of training here a little bit of behavioral training for fun and profit this was a completely random thing it's not like i set out to do it right but uh but of course it was quite noticeable that he started to internalize it and you could do that kind of stuff pretty easily um, I mean, you know, it was weird and manipulative to sort of do it on purpose to play tricks on people. That's not what I was doing. It's just a weird thing that I did, but he picked it up. But after I noticed it, right? So it's very similar kind of in a way, right? Every time that they're signaling that they're having a certain kind of thought, once they learn to identify it, stop. And then you say, stop. They in turn, right? Just get to the point where they say, stop. They can amp it up. There are cases of this with a slightly higher sort of punishment, you know, valence, where people also snap a rubber band. And the idea, right, tch, ah. and the idea in both cases is you're giving this, right? You're giving a stimulus, you're giving a, a reinforcement, uh, right? Uh, conditioning reinforcement. Now, why is this interesting relative to what we were talking about? Well, we'll see more of this when we get into sort of the specific techniques on the Buddhist side next week around this, but this idea of something comes up, stop, and then a substitution, right? Something else that you put in. That's where thought stopping basically is operating. It's like learning just to like stop, stop it, right? In this very direct kind of way that is quite similar to what we see in this like making an effort side. But look again at what I've been talking about here and about how really the effort is used to make it an automatic process. Because eventually Mike Bailey is not something that he's thinking about. And eventually stop is not an effort that you're making. You're making the effort for a short period of time to build it into a habitual system. And this is important, okay? This is the very last thing I'll say because I'm sure I'm definitely over time, considerably over time, so apologies. Um, but this is the thing. One of the core ideas that you see in psychotherapy a lot is this idea of trying, right? It's, it's very common in, in depth work and, and sort of Jungian work, but it's this idea of trying to make the unconscious conscious right, trying to bring unconscious material up and make it conscious. And that's important and it's useful, right? Um, it's important and it's useful because getting conscious contact with something, right, is typically sort of prerequisite. If you, if you don't know what's even happening, it's very hard for you to alter it, right? Um, so this is the whole point of sort of feedback mechanisms, right, is that you sort of make, you have to somehow have some means of 
awareness of the thing, like neurofeedback mechanisms or like the bicycle. But then you don't necessarily want to keep things in the conscious level. You want to be able to pass things off to the unconscious level. That's what habit formation is, right? Your efforts are typically best used in a certain kind of habit formation so that you get automatic things going on their own. And then your very small pool of effort can be used to overcome the small gaps when you need to like push, right? Okay, so I've talked entirely too much. I'll probably pick this thread up a bit next week also because I'm going, there's a lot of things to say here. But because this is such an integral issue for people, this question of making an effort and how that interfaces with motivation, how it interfaces with resistance, it's like, how does one make an effort? And the answer I would say is conserve your energies so that you're making right? You're, you're figuring out which hills you're kind of want to die on. Involve yourself in processes that you make sure you're not spending a bunch of effort in places that you don't need to, right? And, and sort of, you know, learn to move your knife through the joints, as it were. And then you will have in reserve what strength you require. You sort of build these automatic systems to handle a lot of stuff. And then when you need to make a strong conscious, uh, you'll have the juice to do it, like in a kind of burst, right? Okay, um, so we will talk more about this next week. I hope everybody does indeed have a good week, and I'll talk to a bunch of you on Friday.